Thomas uh, Dimelicit uh, funding. We are developing a human attestine uh, biomimetic to study SARS-CoV-2 infection in the gut. So this project is in collaboration with uh, Julian Negro and myself. So why studying coronavirus infection in the intestine? Because among the different COVID-19 patients, there are many that has gastrointestinal symptoms, and these symptoms seem to be uh, um, correlated with the severity of the disease. So the, the gut tissue make a, makes a barrier between the external side of the body where comes the pathogens and the internal side of the body where you can form the immune cells. This barrier is composed of several cell types organized in a 3D architecture, alternating crypt and the lie structure. Moreover, the gut tissue is constantly exposed to mechanical forces, uh, two main forces. One is induced by the fluid flow, inducing shearing forces, and the other induced by the peristaltic motion, inducing a stretching forces. It has been reported that the architecture of the tissue and the mechanical stimulation of the gut is important for each function. So we do believe that it's important also to take this into consideration to investigate intestinal infection in general. So we develop different models to study uh, SARS-CoV-2 gut infection. We compare these two models during SARS-CoV-2 infection, and we obtain very interesting data. So first, on a 2D monolayer, we could see that SARS-CoV-2 could infect and replicate uh, truly in a 2D recapitulated colon on ileum. Moreover, it seems that the ileal cells are much more prone to replicate the virus than the colon. We also observed that most of the cells that were targeted by the virus were differentiated cells in contrast to proliferative ones. Let me present you the differences of our results in the organ and chip system. So more or less, we also observed the same infection and replication of the virus in this context, in this organ and chip system. But the thing that was very striking is that we do observe a tenfold increase in the infection efficiency when we recapitulated the colon cells in a 3D manner and mechanically stimulated, especially uh, with the fluid flow. This means that the recapitulation of the gut tissue uh, at the architecture side, the topology recapitulation, but also the mechanical stimulation is really very important to recapitulate the infectivity of a virus. So I hope that I convince you that we provide you now perhaps another model more physiological to investigate SARS-CoV-2 infection within the gut. Thank you for your attention. So this is uh, the, the work of a team, and especially of uh, Martin Rieu and Nadia Ruiz Guitez. Uh, so this is the two teams from Ecole Normale, and uh, we are uh, developing a single molecule assay. And what the thing we are trying to, to look at is that this virus, uh, as all virus, has a replication system. This is some kind of minimal system in a virus. And this requires two things, a polymerase, here an RNA-dependent polymerase, which copies RNA from the RNA, uh, because uh, the virus is one strand and it has to be copied on the opposite strand and then back to the, to the previous strands. And at the same time, uh, you also need to separate uh, the, the various uh, uh, RNA pieces. And this is done mostly by the uh, helicase, which is called NSP13. And uh, it turns out that uh, this helicase is very much conserved. So for instance, the SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 have roughly nearly exactly the same uh, LEKs except to one amino acid. So this is a very conserved enzyme, which probably means it's a very important enzyme and that if you modify this enzyme, it's, it's a very uh, important for the virus. So the idea is that in our lab, we are able to, to, to assay directly uh, LEKs in real time and just a single LEK is working on a single RNA molecule. So here, for instance, I show the example of the UPF1 LEK, which is just a very close by relative on the NSP13. So it's also an RNA LEK. 
And uh, this is previous work. So the idea is that we use a magnetic tweezer system. So this is a, a, a device where we pull on an RNA molecule that you have on the, on the left there. So this is uh, the, the device. Here we have a magnetic bead. Here we have an RNA hairpin. And this is a template on which the helicase is going to, to load. So this is the UPF1 and the helicase. It un unwinds the hairpin. And as it unwinds the hairpin, the bead move up. And so we can detect this uh, elongation. And then uh, the helicase go on past the apex and go in the opposite direction. And then the hairpin refolds and you see the opposite direction. So this is the normal UPF1 trajectory. So uh, work has been a little uh, uh, complex because it was difficult to prepare a working uh, LEKs. Uh, we are started first with what was in the literature and we, we found, unfortunately, LEKs, we even bought LEKs that were not uh, functional. Uh, we have uh, overcome now those difficulties, thanks to Nadia on this. Uh, there was a lot of work on that. At the same time, we have prepared an RNA substrate where we can actually look at, uh, at those uh, activity. Uh, in the, I, I must say that in, during that time, our, our competitors uh, have published a very elegant work uh, showing basically uh, the, the, the starting points that I'm trying to show today. That is where we see the activity of this LEK. So here, this is two bursts that we have, that I show here of SAFCOV2 LEKs sh uh, shown in real time, where you see that the LEK is, is truly unwinding RNA. So uh, this is a good point. So what the uh, other, uh, our Rockefeller competitor shows is that in fact, this LEK is, is interesting because it's a force dependent LEK. And this means that in fact, there is a high collaboration between the LEKs and the polymerase. This is something that we have demonstrated some time ago on the T4 virus system. Uh, and uh, we hope that we will be able just to distinguish that. So what is the, the idea now? The idea is that it, since we have test to look carefully now to the LEKs, we hope to be able to look at a proposed uh, inhibitor of this LEKs to see whether they are active and they, whether they could be used uh, in, in treatment. So yes, I'm going to show you a starting initiative to use a tool that was developed already with the funds of uh, the DIM uh, for surgery planning and how we plan to use it to try to contribute a little bit to the COVID fight. So, uh, so recently uh, we developed a software that's called Diva that allows inclusion of any 3D medical data in virtual reality. And the idea is that to require any pretreatment and to use optimized ray tracing in order to build the representation and to allow capturing 3D structures and geometry through this visualization and through the power of uh, virtual reality. But in order to give you an idea, let me show you, for example, one video. So this is what you see here is a classical MRI uh, that for our first application of the project, which is the surgery planning in breast cancer. So you can see the raw images. And then using our system, you can see the same data that I just showed you visualized within the DIVA system. Of course, you're seeing this on the 2D screen, so it lacks the impression and the feeling that you get while looking inside a virtual reality headset, but it gives you an idea how data can be transformed and how you can capture structures and complexity of medical images. In that case, the, the fact that the tumor has difficult to see boundaries and uh, where it's located and its specific geometry, in that case, to decide for surgery. The other part is because we can do calculus live, you can see how you can navigate within the data as if you could cut in all direction and thus see the data. Finally, we have a specific system in order to generate transfer functions. So the way the data appears, the contrast, the colors, allowing structures of interest to be seen. Let me go a little bit into the topic of today, which is COVID. I give you a first example here of the data that you can see with, uh, with our system. So here you just see again a 2D capture of the system for lung CT scan, where you can see automatically 
and without requiring segmentation or pretreatment, the appearance of lesions induced in the lungs by the COVID. Here, we're going to change representation to allow you to see better some of the lesions and that we can generate this. Today, there are less uh, debate about uh, effect on the lungs of the COVID and the use for diagnosis, although it provides a quick way to visualize the data without requiring exploring the entire CT scan. A more interesting project that we have now with the Necker Sick Children Hospital is regarding children. While the children are less affected by the disease, it is known that they do have a possible effect myocardite on the heart. So what you see here is an MRI of a 14-year-old boy uh, visualized within our system uh, in a dynamical one. So you're going to see both the, the, the capacity that we have to explore the data in 3D, but also to visualize the dynamics. So this, we're exploring the possible long-term effect on the heart and the effect that the COVID may have on the dynamics of the heart and exploiting our technology to like look and explore the data. Bear in mind that the data that you see here have not been segmented. This is the raw MRI data visualized through our system. And with that, I will conclude and say that we'll keep on working on automating visualization within the VR and getting more efficient representation of the heart for MRI. And I thank the Hospital de Necker for the collaboration and of course the DIVA team, especially Mohamed El Beiri, the head engineer that developed the technology. Thank you.